Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We are here with another Hunter Hunter review and breakdown, and honestly, we have a lot to talk about because a lot was condensed into these three episodes. We're covering episode 104, 105, and 106, right where we left off last time, and we left off on a bunch of cliffhangers. But the big thing is, in one of these three episodes, it's probably my favorite episode of the arc so far. So, let's jump in, and I can give you guys my thoughts on what's happening so far. So, the episode opens up with these two coming out of the palace, and we actually get a little update on what's going on with the Chimera Ants. About 5,000 humans are actually there, up in trees, in like, these weird, like, food sacks. And these guys are, are talking about what's going on with the king and the royal guard. The royal guard basically would, are keeping watch on the king. The king is just playing games. They're kind of at a halt because of the stuff that Kilo was doing. But these two Chimerians are semi-important because they're the two Chimerians going to help Lael when he was supposed to be hunting down Kilo. We jump back over to the capital city and we see Nov still running around taking out um, Nijo's puppets. He's being followed by Flutter with his dragonflies. And eventually he manages to you know turn a corner and use his ability to disappear before Flutter can see what happens. So Flutter thinks he can teleport. Which is kind of true, kind of not. We get an explanation of Nov's ability. He can make basically make portals into a specific space that he creates. And he can make exits and entrances for other people. But they have to go through like certain exits and certain entrances that are set up. Whereas he could just appear wherever he wants. Because he's cool like that. Because he has the master key. We go back over to Chitu versus Moro. Wasn't really much of a fight. Moro's still laying down. Chitu's trying to be annoying, trying to get under his skin, trying to get him to chase him. Moro swings at him. Chitu runs away. Chitu thinks he got him, but he's just like, I'm not doing anything. And he just rolls over and goes back to bed. We jump over back to Meruem and Komugi still playing Gungi. And Meruem makes a really, really cool strategy that basically separate all of his forces from his king and allow him to attack a certain way from the middle. And this is the first time since they started playing that we've seen Komugi hesitate. Now, as they, they keep on playing, she's able to shut him down. We actually see this really cool image of kind of how his, his mind works with the game. Um, he's super, very, very intelligent. And his brain basically goes through all the possible plays and combinations, and he realizes that with just that one move, she beat him. Even Shadowpoof uh, points out that this is the first time that she hesitated. And when Merum asks her why she hesitated, she says that that move is a move that she came up with 10 years before. And that it became such a popular move that it was in textbooks, and, you know, everybody thought it was, it was cool as hell. And... She ended up in a national tournament where it got used against her. And she basically figured out a way to, as she put it, kill it. So when she saw the king come up with the same move as her, it hit her in the feels because it was like her baby was back, but now she had to kill it again. This kind of annoys Meruem. Um, he says that he lost interest and he walks away, tells her to take a break. But when they start up again, she's not getting any more breaks. We jump back over to Moro and uh, Moro and Chitu, and Moro has finally gotten up after four hours, and Chitu was over there, you know, laughing at a, at a book, at a comic book, and Chitu's just like, it's only been half over, what, you've finally given up, are you finally going to chase me? And Moro tells him it's already over. Turns out Moro w uh, made a smoke rope from his pipe all the way around the arena to the other side of Chitu and grabbed on Chitu's leg and was just reeling it in. And even though Chitu tried to run away, the smoke pulled him in and he couldn't he couldn't break it. He tries to like punch the, punch the smoke. It's not breaking. And we actually see him like focus all his aura. The area turns dark and he makes a new net ability. This like crossbow thing. It's got a cloth for close for close range and a crossbow for long range. He shoots it at Moro, Moro blocks it, and Moro asks him, why are you using a weapon that's slower than you are? And Chitu gets distracted, and Moro sh pops up behind him. Turns out that the Moro in front of him that was reeling him in was actually a smoke clone. And it left him completely distracted from the Moro coming up behind him. So Moro touches him, cancels out his ability, they go back to this town where it's now downpouring, 
Moro asks him what would have happened if he hadn't tagged him in the eight hours, and Chichu says it doesn't matter because my condition for that ability, the reason it was so powerful, was because I made the condition that if I was ever tagged, that I wouldn't be able to use it forever, ever again. So they exchange, you know, some shit talking, and Chichu dips out saying he's going to get another ability from Shadow Poof, and he's going to come back and take him out. Moro meets up with Nov in their little space, you know, drinking, drinking some water, eating some food, trying to replenish themselves, and we see Flutter knock the F out, because Nov, uh, Nov actually teleported one of his portals above him, and he saw him looking down, watching, you know, the city, and because of his, his ability to, you know, pop out anywhere, he was already behind him, and Flutter didn't know where he was, he had lost him, so now that he knew they had surveillance, he took out their surveillance as soon as he could. Lael meets up with the other two Chimera Ants, and they re end up realizing that Flutter must be incapacitated because his dragonflies aren't around anymore. And we get uh, an explanation of what Lael's net ability is as he pulls out this little communicator thing. It's actually like a radio, but what it does is when he helps out people, he can basically create kind of a pseudo contract with them where basically he does a favor for them and he tells them it's not free. Or that they owe him and as long as he's seen their net ability or knows its name it gets cataloged in this machine and whatever he wants he can depending on how many times they owe him he can use their ability for an hour granted when he does that they are not able to use the ability anymore so with flutter unconscious he ends up using flutter's ability to now be the one watching over the city so with leo now surveying the city we jump over to Meryl one last time, and we see him sitting on his throne, contemplating how he can't understand how, even though playing against Kamugi is so frustrating, he is enjoying it. And this may be the first time we actually see him admit that he enjoys something. And that's where episode 104 ends. Episode 105, now understand, this is the big one. This episode is probably my favorite episode of the arc so far, because we see a humongous exchange between Kamugi and Meryl. And we really get to delve deep into this character. The episode starts off with Merum showing up, asking why she didn't decide to rest. But Shadow points out that she actually passed out right where she was sitting, literally drooling all over herself. And the first thing Merum says, he doesn't understand how those amazing moves came from such a ridiculously silly and stupid creature. They start playing, and as they're playing, Merum says something that super caught my attention he basically tells her why don't they place a bet on the game if she wins he will give her whatever she wants no matter what it is but if she wins i mean if i'm sorry if mara wins he wants her left arm now obviously kamui doesn't know what she wants but the whole reason he did this was to try and get in her head he straight says that the greed will blind her and that the threat of losing her arm, the fear, would basically snuff out her bravery. I guess this is what he did to some of the other masters, because they saw him, and, you know, they were immediately scared of him. His power, his presence, she's blind. She can only really get the threat of what he says to her. Or at least that's what I thought. Until she responds with, I don't know what I want, but as far as losing my left arm, I'd rather bet what I normally bet. And he's just like, what do you normally bet? She says, I bet my life. And she explains the life of a Gungi player, how she decided to major to become a professional Gungi player, but the only way to really make it as a Gungi player is to become your national representative and win. So you can't lose a game, like ever. Because as soon as, you, as soon as somebody else becomes better than you, you're basically worthless. She's supposed to be the breadwinner for her family, and if she loses as a Gungi player, then now she becomes a burden to her family because she's not able to help support them. And when Meruem realizes her conviction, he realizes that he didn't put it into a perspective that what if she had asked for his life? Like, she's putting her life on the line for every single game. No wonder it's such a big deal and how she will not slack at all. And he feels like not only did he disrespect her, he disrespected himself for underestimating her conviction. And he rips off his own left arm. She he rips it off and <laughs> squirts blood all over her face. And Poof spazzes. Poof's like, oh my god, what are you doing? We can't do it. He tries to wrap up his arm. 
And he just like, Meryl wants to keep playing. And Pooh's like, we have to go take you to Pito now. She has to fix you. And he smacks the shit out of Poof with his tail. Sends him flying into a wall. And Kumugi shows the first signs that she cares, not only because he is the king, but as a fellow Gungi player, as a friend. She refuses to play him until his arm's better. Mind you, she doesn't know that his arm is literally ripped off, completely severed. He threatens her, says that he'll kill her if she doesn't play, and she says, it doesn't matter, I'm still not going to play until your arm is better. So he caves, and he tells Poof to go get Pito, and we find out something I'm interesting about Pito's ability. Pito does have the ability to heal people, but when he does, it consumes all of his Nen. He can't do anything else. So Pito's N is special because it's massive. He can cover that entire palace by himself and basically feel anything that comes in, even farther than the palace. We saw a small example of this with Kite in the back with the Queen's uh, Fortress, but the difference between the, the Royal Guards is staggering. Nove and Moral realize that, you know, the end that was enca encapsulating the castle isn't there. And this is their chance to enact their plan. Now, I don't mean their attack plan, but their setup. So their setup is supposed to be that Nove is supposed to go to the castle and plant his portals so that way they can use that to infiltrate at a moment's notice. So this is literally the only chance he has to get there. Now, Nove and Moral split up. Nove goes to do his mission. Moral goes to keep a watch over the city with his deep purple. Leo and his Chimerians were, were watching them with uh, Flutter's ability. And once he realized they split up, they decide to go after Moro. We jump back over to Pito, and we get to see the other half of Pito's net ability, Dr. Blythe. Dr. Blythe can fix basically any, any ability, but again, it consumes all of Pito's Nen, so he can't use Nen for anything else. So with P2 fixing the king, he says it's going to take about two to three hours. Shadow Poof says, my end is not as good as yours, but I'll use it to keep watch as best I can. We jump over to Nove, who is now at, uh, at the palace, and he starts to close the distance to the palace. He's running, he's running undercover. We get some info from the narrator. It turns out that there are actually three humans on the premises that aren't being killed. Kamugi, the king, because they're using him as a puppet. And this guy, Director Bezof, Bezef. Uh, it turns out that the reason he's so important is because he was kind of the shadow ruler behind the scenes. He took care of all the diplomatic uh, paperwork, everything between other countries. Like, the king was the face. This guy did everything else. And it turns out that he's actually really valuable, especially when it comes to, you know, the ants want to do their thing. Uh, they want to, you know, take over the world one nation at a time. They don't want... They could easily mess up and have every nation of the world take them out. So they'd rather keep undercover, so they're going to use this guy to make sure that other nations think everything is fine. But it turns out this guy is a little bit of a leech. As he's working, he gets an email about meat. And he starts looking through pictures of girls, and he sees a bunch of girls. He picks a bunch of pictures... He sees one that he likes. We zoom in on it, and we jump over to the general that was helping Novin Moral, and it, we see the girl that he picked. Turns out it's actually Palm in Disguise, and that's kind of where the episode ends. Episode 106 kicks off right there. No, it's no still closing the distance to the castle. So, besides the three humans that are there, we also find out from the narrator that there's actually not a whole lot of Chimerians that are actually there. There's the three royal guards, there's Marum. The only squadron leader that came back was Chitu. Leo too, but he's out. And there's, a few, there's I think, they said there were six other ants, uh, just common soldier ants. So, right now, there's three humans and 11 ants on, on the premises and nobody else. There's nobody else guarding, them, guarding anything. As Nob gets closer, he gets to the outer wall. He makes one of his uh, his teleport holes. His goal is to make one right on the outside, uh, toward the middle of, of the entrance, and then one as close to the back staircase as possible, because the back staircase leads to the throne room. 
He manages to get the first two without any real uh, resistance because the Royal Guard have their own issues where they don't trust any of the other ants to, to safeguard the compound. So that actually makes it a lot easier because nobody's on guard duty and without P2's N covering everything, there's a giant hole in their defense. Now, as he's going toward the staircase, a Chimera comes out and we get to see Nov do this really, really cool move that is like some something out of Doctor Strange. You know, the, the big meme of what he should have done to Thanos with taking Thanos' arm off. But he basically opens up a sh one of his holes in a really, really strange shape, wraps it around the ant's head, and then closes it, slicing the, the, the ant's head right off. He drags the body away. He freaks out. Basically has a panic attack because he doesn't know if anybody else was there or saw him. He manages to get rid of the body with, with one of his teleport holes, but his shoes are covered in blood. And this is where I think he made the one mistake. Because he takes the shoes off, but he leaves them behind. What he should have done was he should have made another hole and got rid of the shoes. But that's neither here nor there. He runs barefoot. He gets to the final staircase. And he's ready to go up the staircase and try to get a teleport hole as close as possible. But then he sees this. This is actually what I believe, well, at least I believe it is, it's Shao Poof's N. It only can cover the top floor, so it's really nowhere near the level of P2's. But as soon as he sees it, he starts freaking out. He realizes that he can't go any farther, so he makes the hole right there near the staircase. And he tries to bounce out. But we cut over back to Moral and Lael. Lael confronts Moral and basically explains how he's going to take out Moral. Moral's just like, I thought I had the other two Chimerians, you know, a wolf and a, a shrimp. And he's like, yeah, they're around, but uh, I'm here now. And Moral takes off. Basically trying to lure Lael, you know, somewhere they can fight. Right now, it's raining all over the place, so his smoke is not going to be as effective. So he needs an area where he can use the smoke. We see Nov as he's trying to leave and a bunch of trucks show up. It's supposed to be what they, they said it was a food delivery. But apparently it's not just food. It's food. It's supposed to be meat for the ants, but it's also women for Director Bezef. Bezef pulls out the women, tells them, you guys will live here. You have one job. Your job is to take care of me. Whatever I tell you to do, you do it. Everything else will be provided to you. We see the, all the girls, and we know we, the one in the middle is actually uh, Palm. So Palm had another mission. Her mission is to literally get eyes on the king of the royal guard. The way her ability works, we thought, you know, she has the crystal ball with the mermaid crystal ball, uses her blood to activate it. Once she's seen a person, the crystal ball can be used to see them no matter where they are, when they are. And once they once they have her ability to use on them, they can, you know, make the plans around the royal guard and the king whenever they want. They can see exactly what they're doing. Problem is, not only does she have to get out of this compound that she's now stuck in, she has to get to the Royal Guard and the and the King without getting caught, without dying. And as soon as they sense that she's there, she's likely to die. Now, we actually get to see into Nov's head and uh, Palm's head a little more. Because Palm basically explains that if she gets caught, she's going to off herself. We saw the same thing from Nov a little while ago. I'm sorry, I kind of missed it. But they basically explain how neither one of them is afraid of dying. They're afraid of being tortured and all their information getting forced out of them. Like we saw what Pito did with um, Puckle, where she took the antennas and lobotomized him and used that to get him to spill all the secrets of Nen. Imagine if, if they did that with the entire plan of them attacking the king. Like they would, they would fail miserably. We go back over to Nov, who's finally out of the compound. He's still drenched. He's barefoot. He finally collapses you know hundreds of hundreds of yards away from him from the uh, the compound and he has a full-blown panic attack crying his eyes out curling up and basically into the fetal position praying for palm and for himself and basically when he sensed shadow poofs and the malice the hatred he described it as the feeling of everything terrible in the world all rolled into one and it broke him it absolutely crushed his spirits he even says, I cannot go back there. And he doesn't understand how Gon and Kilo were not only felt saw this and they felt it. They were in it. They were feet from it when P2, you know, jumped over and and, and uh, attacked Kite. And he doesn't know how they have the strength to keep going. 
and he's so worried that Palm's gonna die. He's so worried that he's gonna die. Like he can't, he can't do it. And honestly, with such a calm, cool, and collected character, such an intelligent character, seeing him break down like that was just like moving on. <laughs> we go back to Lael and Moral. They're in this cathedral now, and they start prepping their nun abilities. Moral lets out a bunch of smoke. It cuts us back over to Palm, who is now, even though Bicep chose to be with another woman, Palm kind of uh, interrupts with a drink. But he really likes the way Palm looks, so he invites her in. Basically, she's going to uh, take care of him. And then you, once he's you know out, she's going to go and try to leave. We jump back over to Leo and Moral again. So, Lero tries to tell Moral about a band that he listens to, which is funny because he does look like a, like a punk rocker or a metalhead. And he tells him about a band called Black Planet. They sound amazing. Tells him about their second album, you know. It's like, it's one giant story. We've seen plenty of artists do that. And he's like, at the end of it, you feel like you've just read a really, really good book. But the thing about the album is that it's exactly 60 minutes, so he's using it as a timer for his end ability. So, Moral surrounds himself with smoke. Uh, Leo pulls out one of the tickets of somebody who owes him a favor, snaps it, and bam, the episode ends with them about the fight. So we're again left with another cliffhanger with Moral fighting again after he just finished beating Chitu. And we still have no idea what's going on with Kilua. Nova is broken, and Palm, Palm's in probably in the worst situation any of them could be in. A lot is going down. Kamugi and the King, like, episode 105 was absolutely insane. Seeing him act the way he did because of the things Kamugi said, it was just, I'm ready to keep going. So that's the end of this review, guys, this, this breakdown. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop a like, subscribe, stick with me because I'm going to try and get another one out tomorrow. If I can't, there'll definitely be one next week. But that's it for me, guys, and I'll catch you on the next video. Later.